Carr, and I'm coordinator for the Coastal Marine Ecosystem Based Management Tools Network, the EBM Tools Network. Um, and I'm very pleased you can all be here today. I'd like to introduce you to, to my co host, Ray Everard, who is a project manager with Octo. Um, and we're very pleased today to have Madhavi Colton and Tim Walsworth here with us. Madhavi is with the Coral Reef Alliance and Tim is with the Utah State University. Um, and they're going to be speaking today about the management and evolution, management and evolution give hope to coral reefs facing the effects of climate change. So it'll be great to have some good news on the climate front um, from them. Uh, before we before I turn it over, I just wanted to um, let you guys know how to ask questions. So we're going to have a presentation first, and then we'll switch into a, a Q and A. Um, there's two ways you can ask questions. You can type it into the chat panel, or you can type it into the question area. Uh, the question area will only be seen by um, the presenters and the the moderators. Um, the chat, you have the option of just making it only visible to um, the, the the moderators and the um, presenters or to everyone. Um, you are able to share information with the rest of the group through the chat. We just ask that you use this power wisely. Um, but anyway, we encourage you to send in questions throughout the webinar um, and we can hold the substantive questions uh, till the end of the Q&A. So feel free to send them in as you think of them. Okay, well, welcome. Um, Madhavi and Tim, uh, thank you for being here. I'll, I'll turn it over to you guys now. Thank you, Sarah. This is Madhavi Colton. I'm the program director at the Coral Reef Alliance, and I'm really excited to speak with you, you all today. I'm going to kick off this webinar this morning, um, pass it over to Tim, and then, uh, and then he'll pass it back to me to close things out. So as Sarah mentioned, today we're going to be talking about how management and evolution give hope to coral reefs facing the effects of climate change. Next slide, please. So I don't think it's a big assumption to guess that all of you who have joined this webinar this morning are worried about this globe that we are sitting on that is floating in space. And I'm sure that each of you um, has a focal system or species or group of species that you're working on. I'm also guessing that most of us on this uh, webinar are focused more on the blue parts of our globe than the, the brown and green. But what I'd like to do is um, invite you all to keep your focal system in mind as we go through this talk. All ecosystems on our planet are facing the effects of climate change. And the work that we're gonna speak about today is how we can help these ecosystems deal with the changes that are already happening and that are only predicted to intensify. Today, we're gonna to use coral reefs as a focal biome, but these results in this approach can apply to many other ecosystems. So if you're not a coral reef buff, Feel free to keep your particular ecosystem in mind. Next slide, please. So we are focused on coral reefs because they're a pretty amazing ecosystem. They are um, about 25% of all reefs at some point during their um, life history, 4% uh, floor. They uh, provide livelihoods and income to about 250 million people and are worth an estimated 375 billion US dollars per year. Next slide, please. And unless you've been living in a cave, you will have seen some news about coral reefs. And most of that news is that they are in trouble. So to turn those headlines into data, next slide, please. Here's a graph that's older now, it's from 2003, and it shows the average live coral cover uh, and the Caribbean, across the Caribbean reefs. 1977 was around 50, 55% live coral cover on average. And then by 2002, it was around 18%. Next slide, please. To turn those graph, that graph into photos, here's uh, two photos from Discovery Bay in Jamaica, the one on the left from 1978 the one on the right from 2011. And these photos are taken from the same exact point. And the reason we know that is that the quadrat on the left is anchored to a survey pin. And if you've got sharp eyes, you'll see that same survey pin in the bottom of the photo on the right. Next slide, please. Lest you get lulled into complacency thinking that it takes 30 years for a reef to die, here are some data to show that that's not always the case. These are photographs were taken by the Catlin Seaview Survey. You can see a healthy reef in December of 2014, a bleached reef in February of 2015, and then that reef dead by August. 
Bleaching um, happens when uh, the water around a reef gets too warm for too long and corals expel the symbiotic algae that live in their tissues, they turn bright white. And those um, symbiotic algae, the zooxanthellae, provide food to the coral. And so if that warm water event goes on too long, the corals start to starve and can die. Um, Corals can recover from bleaching, um, but the longer the warm water event goes on, the less likely that recovery is. Next slide, please. So the question is, what are we doing about it? What is the coral conservation community? Um, what are our approaches to, to remedying these, these problems? So I'm going to briefly summarize some of the strategies that are out there right now. Next, please. There's a lot of um, focus on um, narrowing our, our conservation strategies down. And where there's interest in doing that because we have finite resources and what feels like an increasingly limited amount of time as reefs are experiencing annual bleaching in many parts of the world. And so um, some of the ideas out there right now are that we find um, what are called thermal refugia. Those are areas that are cold, colder now and that are predicted to remain cold in the future. And that we focus our efforts on protecting those reefs because those are the places where the corals are less likely to experience the um, full effects of climate change. And there are others who advocate the direct opposite strategy, which is actually we should focus on protecting areas that are hot because that's the places where corals that are pre-adapted to climate change live. And so we can actually protect that pre-adaptation, if you will, by, by focusing our efforts on that. Next, please. Similarly, there are um, uh, approaches out there that advocate for protecting areas with high coral cover with the idea that there are enough individuals um, or colonies in those places that they can survive uh, some population reductions and continue to thrive. Others say, actually, it's in places where there's low coral cover that we find the most robust or resilient corals because they've survived everything that's thrown at them so far. So we should actually protect low coral cover areas. And then finally, there are moves afoot to um, figure out how we can either selectively breed or genetically engineer extremophiles or corals that are particularly heat tolerant. So all of these strategies are, are good, um, but they have limitations. And many, many of the limitations in these strategies are that they rely on predictions of the future. And there are irreducible uncertainties in those predictions, particularly when we downscale them. We know that the temperature on Earth overall is going to warm, but year to year, at the scale at which an individual coral experiences its environment, we don't know what's going to happen. And so if we um, narrow down our, our strategy to focus on just a few things, we're worried that what we're doing is reducing the natural diversity that is required to help um, these systems adapt. And so the, um, the Coral Reef Alliance, together with our academic partners at Rutgers University and the University of Washington thought, is there something else we could bring to bear on this question? Next slide, please. And so what we started thinking about are ecological diversity portfolios. Next slide, please. So we're gonna travel north from coral reefs up to Alaska, where researchers, uh, including Tim, um, did some work on salmon up in an area called Bristol Bay. Next slide, please. And in this area, there's an amazing network of lakes, rivers, creeklets, and um, the salmon that uh, return to this area to spawn, the individuals have a variety of life history characteristics. And what the researchers found, next please, is that the diversity in life history characteristics actually meant that the system as a whole was more stable. And this is a basically diversity portfolio theory that was first described for economics back in the 50s. And the basic idea from the economic perspective was that if you wanted to invest money in the stock market, we all know you don't want to just buy one particular stock with, with your funding. You will even don't want to just invest in one type of industry. You really want to spread out your investments. And that way, if, if something happens and one stock goes up, another or one stock goes down, another might go up. And that over time, the return on your investment is more likely to be stable. And that's what these researchers found working in Alaska was that that life history characteristic diversity conferred stability to the system. And that's very different, next slide please, 
to what we see in the west coast of North America, where particular types of salmon were selected uh, to be bred in hatcheries. And then the system was flooded with particular single life history characteristics, which led to an amazing, and still continuing to this day, amazing boom and bust cycles in that fishery. And so we saw this research and we thought, well, could we actually apply this same thinking to coral reef ecosystems or to any system that's facing the effects of climate change? And instead of aiming for the emergent property of a um, stable fisheries return, could we actually um, aim for uh, ecosystem or evolutionary adaptation to climate change? Next slide, please. And so you can just hit next, perfect. And so maybe we can replace those question marks at the bottom by hitting next um, with diversity portfolios. But in order to understand how these different conservation strategies could perform, um, what we need to do is understand how species respond to rapid environmental change. Next slide, please. Um, and that will help us identify how to move ahead, what we can do today. So again, in the interest of, of simplifying, I'm going to simplify species responses to climate change. So um, first is uh, species can respond ecologically to climate change. And there are great examples out there. This one is um, by Malin Pinsky's research showing how fish distributions are changing in response to um, uh, warming ocean conditions. Next, please. Species can also obviously evolve in response to rapid environmental change. One of the clearest examples of this comes from Northern Europe, where there are two color morphs of an owl species. Um, your grayer and browner color morph. The grayer uh, morph um, has higher uh, hunting success when it's snowy out. And that hunting success uh, results in uh, better eggs and better provisioned young. And so there's actually a Darwinian fitness component to the color morph here. And what we're seeing is that as conditions in Northern Europe change, we're seeing differences in the relative abundance of these two color morphs, which is an evolutionary response to climate, climate change. And then the third way that species respond to climate change is to go extinct. So for my viewpoint as a conservation biologist, I'm really interested um, in how what we can do to help these um, responses to climate change occur. And I'll say that as far as number three goes, we're doing a really good job of that already. Um, and I would like us to stop being quite so good at driving species towards extinction. So maybe we can take that one off the, off the table for the rest of this talk. Next, please. So from ecological perspective, there's actually been a lot of work done on how we could um, promote or facilitate or, or just even um, account for ecological responses to climate change. Um, in terrestrial systems, for example, there are habitat corridors or terrestrial parks are designed in such a way to allow range shifts or um, changes in distribution patterns. But uh, next please, on the evolutionary side, people aren't really thinking about what we can do to facilitate natural evolutionary responses to climate change. Next please. And even less is being done on interactions between ecological and evolutionary processes. And there's even less known about what we can do to help these along. Next, please. So um, I guess one of the first questions I get when I, when I start to talk about this is, well, can corals adapt to, to these conditions? And this photo you have in front of you was taken from a warm water event in Honduras a couple of years ago. And what you can see here is um, some evidence of bleaching, but you can also see the heterogeneous response to that warm water condition. Um, so one coral has bleached, but a coral in the same species doesn't seem to have bleached. And then for other uh, corals, only part of the colony is bleached. And so this suggests that there is a diversity of responses to environmental conditions, and that diversity is the raw material of adaptation. So what's more is that um, there's been a lot of research done over the past six or seven years into um, the evolutionary um, or genetic underpinnings of heat tolerance in corals. Next, please. So Cheryl Logan um, and uh, colleagues uh, found that there's actually already evidence that corals have adapted to some warming since the onset of the Industrial Revolution. Next, please. 
Steve Palumbi's group has done some work out in American Samoa, understanding the genetic um, underpinnings of heat tolerance in corals. Next, please. And then Misha Matt's lab at the University of um, Texas has done some work showing that heat tolerance is actually heritable um, across uh, generations. And so we've got some understanding that corals can adapt, we've got a diversity of response types, and then some understanding of how heat tolerance actually functions um, in corals. But again, what's, what's missing here is that last step that says, what can we do um, as managers, as researchers, as conservation people, as policymakers, to answer this very important question? What can we do to ensure that coral reefs continue to provide benefits to wildlife and people? And what can we do today? And so I'll pass it over to Tim to walk through some of the research we've been doing um, to uh, answer this question. Take it away, Tim. Okay, thanks, Madhavi. <clears throat> so today I'm going to dive into uh, the details of a paper that we just had uh, get published in Nature Climate Change that delves into these questions of what can we do to uh, help coral reefs adapt to climate change. And uh, Madhavi worked with a fantastic group of collaborators on this paper, including uh, Daniel Schindler and Timothy Essington at Washington, University of Washington, Mike Webster at Coral Reef Alliance, Steve Plumby at Stanford, Peter Mumby at University of Queensland, and Malin Pinsky at Rutgers. Um, so given what Madhavi pre uh, presented previously and you know, what we know about the current state of coral reefs and how they're responding to uh, climate change, and also this growing body of literature suggesting they have the uh, capacity to adapt uh, genetically to uh, increasing temperatures, we ask the broad question of how can managers maximize the likelihood of successful coral adaptation? And within this broad question, we explore how does accounting for evolutionary capacity affect spatial management recommendations? So where do you choose to uh, manage local stressors? And then importantly, how sensitive are these recommendations to biological uncertainty? So uh, we often don't have perfect measures of dispersal ability or the heritability of uh, any given trait. So how sensitive are our recommendations to this uncertainty? Now, I, ideally you'd be able to go out, find a coral, a series of coral reefs and run a bunch of experiments on uh, these reefs in natural settings to test different approaches. However, the large scale nature of the problem, both in space and time, kind of uh, makes these ecosystem scale experiments um, infeasible. It, it, it's not a reasonable way of going about answering these questions uh, rapidly enough to provide useful answers. Um, but simulation modeling allows rapid exploration of many scenarios uh, across the same uh, simulated landscapes to provide answers and comparisons amongst different strategies. So it's the, it's the approach we adopted in this uh, paper. We modified the eco-evolutionary model developed by uh, Jason Norberg et al. in 2012. Um, and don't worry, I'm not going to dig into the equations too much, but we'll walk through a little bit just the kind of verbal description. This model uh, tracks the change in population as a function of population dynamics, so population growth, um, and genetic load and dispersal. And also tracks the change in trait, where the trait we're talking about in our paper is the thermal optimum uh, temperature the optimum temperature for growth for the species. And this is a function of directional selection and gene flow. The fitness, so how the population dynamics change from uh, time step to time step is a function of the species growth rate, interacting with competition uh, between species, uh, minus the mortality for the time step. And the growth rate is a function of the species maximum growth rate, which is a trait uh, interacting with how their Thermal optimum matches their environment, um, and then divided by their uh, thermal tolerance, where species with a broader thermal tolerance will grow slower, but will be less susceptible to, uh, or will be decrease in growth more slowly when temperatures are not optimum, and species with a narrow tolerance will grow fast when temperatures at their optimum, but their growth will decline more rapidly as the environment moves away from their optimum temperature. 
we modified the Norberg model uh, to account for uh, temperature effects on mortality, as often seen in uh, corals. So in this figure, we have temperature on the x-axis, uh, growth rate on the y-axis. The thin black line shows the mortality rate. You can see it's constant until this thermal optimum in the center, and then increases rapidly up to uh, a rate of one, so total mortality once temperature gets too hot. Uh, when combined with the dashed line, which is the, uh, the growth rate, which is just a normal curve centered on that thermal optimum, it results in a population growth rate, or lambda, that is asymmetric, showing declines at both too cold of temperatures and too hot of temperatures, but much more rapid declines at hot temperatures. To give kind of a visual representation of the model we uh, the model and the model ecosystem that we explored. Uh, we've got a few slides of, kind of cartoon reefs here. So we modeled an ecosystem that's composed of reefs that have two functional groups of corals that we're going to refer to as our species. Uh, one of them representative of a fast-growing uh, but temperature-sensitive species and one representative of a slower-growing but uh, more stress-tolerant species. Um, and the reefs also are home to macroalgae, and these three species compete for space on the individual reefs. Each individual reef is located within a simulated reef network that's composed of a linear um, chain of individual reefs, and each reef has a different abundance of the two coral species and macroalgae. The reefs each have their own uh, unique ambient temperature, and the temperatures are cold at one end of the reef and they increase to uh, warmer temperatures at the other end of the reef network. And then the two uh, species of corals have thermal optimum traits that are adapted to the ambient temperatures at their home reef. Uh, corals can disperse up and down the reef network um, through, a, through larval dispersal um, mechanic. And the population dynamics on each individual reef, again, are a function of the match between the temperature on the reef and the trait of the coral species. So this relationship affects not only the abundance of corals and the growth rate of corals, but also drives this directional selection of traits. So this directional selection allows these traits to adapt through time, the two species, and this allows them to track their uh, the changes in temperature um, if they have a fast enough um, adaptation rate. So for our simulations, we ran a kind of a burn-in period of historical conditions with stable long-term average temperatures, but with some annual variation in those temperatures built in. So some years are hot, some years are cold, um, and the individual reefs in the network don't all get the same um, random variation in temperatures in any given year, but in general, hot year will be hotter than normal on all the reefs. The cold year will be colder than normal, but there'll be some slight variation amongst reefs. So we let the, the different reefs kind of settle out into their into a uh, historical state after this burn-in period. And then we implemented a warming climate where the temperature warmed over a period of 150 to 200 years before equilibrating at a new ambient temperature. At the onset of this climate change period, uh, we used different prioritization strategies to select individual reefs for local management. And on those reefs that were selected for local management, we indicated here with blue, the managed area. We simulated uh, the effective management of a local stressor um, that causes an increase in mortality of macroalgae, which thus decreases competition for space with the corals. And you can think of this as uh, uh, regulations on fishing that reduce fishing mortality on herbivorous fishes. So that management increases the uh, predation rate of these fishes on the macroalgae, cropping them down, opening space up for the corals. 
I, we can think of it as any number of different management strategies that may uh, increase mortality of these macroalgae. As competition for the for space with the macroalgae decreases, corals have more space to grow. They can obviously um, can increase, and we can see these changes through time. And we also vary the number of managed areas um, that are selected for local management uh, across our different scenarios. And then in the long run, as these populations in managed areas are able to increase in coral cover, those corals are uh, theoretically able to spill out through larval dispersal um, and provide benefits to neighboring unmanaged um, reefs. So for simulation experiments, we used coral cover as a proxy for reef system function. So reefs that had more coral cover uh, were considered to be more functional, had a better reef system function. And we explored the effect of both evolutionary and ecological responses to climate change. So evolutionary responses being genetic adaptation and ecological responses being dispersal. We explored a range of values for each. And we also explored the effect of protected area size. So what proportion of the total reef network was designated as a managed area where Again, these local stressors are removed. So first, we'll just look at simply how does evolution affect the coral's ability to persist throughout climate change? And you'll see two figures here showing are with the exact same uh, axes. The x-axis is the genetic variance. This can be thought of as how heritable this thermal trait optimum is. Higher values mean um, it's more her heritable. They can genetically adapt faster. And the x-axis is the proportional coral cover at the end of the simulation. The left panel will be a scenario where there's no dispersal uh, between reefs. And the y-axis, sorry, the second panel on the right will indicate scenarios with higher dispersal. And then the three different colors of bars you'll see will be different levels of uh, protected areas. So the green bar will be there's no protected areas, no managed areas. The Orange bar will indicate 20% of the reef network is protected, and the blue bar will indicate scenarios where 50% of the reef network is protected. <clears throat> so for the scenario where there's no dispersal, we can see one very striking effect. That is, unless there's a moderate amount of uh, evolutionary capacity, so if you move further down, further right on that x-axis, uh, there's no corals are left at the end of the simulation um, when they're, unless you have some modest level of genetic variance. We also see that as genetic variance increases or continues to increase, you get more corals remaining at the end of the uh, simulation. We also see that as you increase the level of protected area, uh, you get an increase in uh, proportional coral cover on the reef. We look at the high dispersal scenario. This is where coral larvae can move between, or can, uh, can drift between the reefs. See a very similar pattern where until you have a modest level of uh, genetic variance present, you really don't see much of any coral cover on the reefs. Um, again, we see this effect of increased protection increases the amount of coral cover remaining. Uh, but again, if you're at low levels of genetic variance, you have very low levels of coral cover remaining. So this suggests that this ability to evolutionary adapt is critically important to um, whether or not corals will persist in the system. We also saw that the amount of uh, the, the proportion of the reef that is managed to reduce these local stressors is really important to determining how much of the uh, how much coral cover there will be at the end of our simulated uh, experiments. So the question then becomes, how do you prioritize which locations to protect? Uh, everyone who's protecting reefs or managing reefs, uh, agencies and organizations working to uh, conserve these coral reef ecosystems are working with limited budgets, be that uh, monetary funding, uh, people, or time. And therefore, they must prioritize the activities that they undertake to provide the, 
the best conservation benefit given their efforts. As Madhavi described earlier, there have been many pr approaches suggested to prioritize protected areas. These include uh, uh, protecting climate refugia, protecting based on the current coral cover, or protecting sites based on the heterogeneity amongst the sites, just to name a few options. So in our simulations, we explored uh, eight different strategies for prioritizing local management that can be uh, grouped into three broad categories. First are the temperature-based strategies, and these are selecting uh, pre-adapted reefs. So those are reefs that are historically warm and may contain uh, individuals or genes that are adapted to um, conditions that may be more prominent in the future. The thermal refugia strategy, which protects colder reefs. So those, those are reefs that are more likely to either remain or become suitable in the future as temperatures warm. Hey, Tim, I lost you for a few seconds. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. We, uh, could you go back a little bit? We lost you. Um, your, your sound is a little unstable. Um, if it gets, let's go on for a while, and if it gets worse, uh, we may ask you to switch to the telephone. Okay. okay. Oh. It, yeah. So I'll, I'll start this slide over. Yes. So we, we explored uh, eight different spatial prioritization strategies uh, that can be categorized into three broad groups. Uh, the first group is the, are those strategies based on um, historic temperatures of the reefs. You, the first strategy within there is the pre-adapted strategy where you select reefs that are historically hot uh, with the expectation that these the individuals and genes on these reefs uh, may be pre-adapted to uh, future warm temperatures. The thermal refugia strategy protects the colder sites that may become or remain uh, suitable into the future. And then there's a combination of these two strategies, kind of splitting your effort halfway between pre-adapted sites and thermal refugia. The second broad category are, the, are choosing sites based on the historic cover. So those are selecting sites that have the most abundant coral. So those corals are, uh, they, the idea being that those are your best sites. Those are the corals most likely to remain uh, present on the landscape and also uh, most likely to have enough individuals to survive these stresses. The second cover base would be the conservation reliant or lower cover sites. So those sites that um, maybe rely on local action to maintain coral cover. Or as Madhavi mentioned, they, these may also, the, the corals remaining in these sites may hold these uh, very resilient genes in the population. And the third broad category are these diversity-based strategies. Uh, the first being to a strategy maximizing diversity and connectivity. So this maximizes the diversity in both habitat, so temperature here, um, diversity in traits, and the connectivity among sites that are in the protected network. Uh, the second strategy within this group is going to be efficient portfolio. And this is similar to what Madhavi described in the intro, where you select the portfolio of individual reefs, which maximize the average coral cover within the reef while minimizing the covariance amongst those reefs. So how you don't want all your protected areas to all increase at the same time and decrease at the same time. You want them to kind of balance each other out. And then the last of these diversity-based strategies is what we're calling opportunistic here. And this is basically you, you protect reefs that become available to be protected. And mechanistically in our model, those are just selected at random. And on the right, you've got an example layouts of these different managed areas for one scenario. With blue indicating the protected areas, gray indicating unprotected areas, uh, up and down this linear reef. So which, priori which of these prioritization strategies best allows corals to adapt to climate change? So first we're going to look at the relative coral cover at the end of our simulations. So a uh, relative coral cover value of one, which would be all the way to the right, indicates that that strategy performed best in that simulation. A value of zero indicates a zero cover. And values in between are just kind of proportions of that best performing strategy in a given scenario. And these box, box, box plots show the distribution of 
relative coral cover across the uh, stochastic simulations we ran for the different strategies. And you can see that three broad groups kind of pop out here where the maximum diversity and connectivity and opportunistic strategies perform very well in all the stochastic scenarios. Um, maximum diversity and connectivity, in fact, is the best performing, best performing strategy in over half of the stochastic simulations and is always at least or within less than 10% of the best performing strategy. The opportunistic strategy also performed very well. The next category or next kind of group would be the portfolio and the two cover-based strategies, which uh, tended to be on average about 80%, 80 to 90% of the best performing strategy cover. But these three strategies were the best performing strategy on, uh, in several stochastic runs. As you can see by the uh, far right whisker for their boxes lining up with the, the one value. And then the third group are the three temperature-based strategies, which were never the best performing strategy. Their whiskers never hit the one. And sometimes we're only uh, maintaining half of the coral cover of the best performing strategy. So these results in this figure are only for the scenario where 20% of the reef is managed. We can look at how this can change with increasing amount of protected area. So in this next figure, we've got proportion of the reef network that's protected on the X from zero on the way on the left to 50% of the reef protected on the, all the way to the right. And proportion coral cover on the Y axis. So in black, you can see uh, the ending coral cover when nothing is protected, no sites are protected. And you can see this ranges from no coral cover, so functional extinction, to about 15% with, an, with a median value right around 2%. So very low coral cover if you do not protect any of the sites. But if we look at the scenarios where some, at least some of the reef is protected, we can see that all of the strategies maintain some coral cover as long as some sites are protected. We can see that as more of the reef network is protected, you get increasing uh, coral cover at the end of the simulation for all the scenarios. So there's this positive trend across all of them. We can also see that the dark green uh, points and bars, which are the maximum diversity and connectivity and opportunistic scenario, uh, strategies, tend to be the top two performing strategies across pretty much every level of protection. And the temperature-based strategies, the blue shades, tend to be the three lowest regardless of the level protected. And there's a lot of variation amongst uh, different stochastic runs, but this general trend holds. And interestingly, if we look at the proportion coral cover at the end of the simulation for uh, the maximum diversity and connectivity strategy, when you protect 20% of the reef, so this dashed green line, we can see that it's actually greater than the median coral cover remaining at the end of the simulations for the thermal refuge strategy at 30% cover. So you, this suggests that for less conservation effort or cost, you get a better conservation return using this uh, diversity-based strategy. So next we wanna look at where the corals are maintained. Are they only inside and only outside the reserves? How has this changed through time? Next couple of figures you'll see are going to have coral cover inside the reserves on the X, coral cover outside the reserves on the Y, and then each uh, prioritization strategy will be a different line on this figure showing the trajectory through time. So the starting point will be the coral cover inside versus outside at the beginning of the time change period, and then the annual steps will create this trajectory tracing that change in cover inside versus outside reserves across the whole time frame of the simulation. So if we first look at the scenario with no genetic variance, uh, we see an answer that uh, we saw earlier, basically when there's no genetic variance, all of these strategies crash to functional extinction, um, so this is regardless of how you uh, select your um, protected area. 
all of them decline both inside and outside of the reserves. And there's a functional extinction of corals without genetic variation. But as soon as we allow some genetic variation, so this uh, evolutionary capacity, we can see uh, that we're able to maintain coral as well as the differences amongst these strategies kind of popping up. So when there's low genetic variance, we can see that the coral cover initially increases inside of the reserves and then crashes outside of the reserves. So as the climate warms, the corals outside of these protected areas where the local stresses are not being um, efficiently managed uh, decline relatively rapidly. However, in the reserves where the local stresses are managed, they maintain their coral cover fairly well, um, showing slight declines. And then as the climate stabilizes again, you see the recovery both inside and outside of the reserves. And we see that these diversity-based strategies really speed up this recovery, uh, particularly outside of the reserves. We see a very similar pattern when there's high genetic variance in the populations. Um, we see less of a steep decline as the corals are able to adapt more rapidly to the changing temperatures. We see less difference amongst the strategies but we do still see that these diversity-based strategies in green uh, performing much better than, the, particularly than the temperature-based strategies in blue. So we see that evolution is important and prioritization strategy is important to how uh, coral will respond to climate change. But we also wanna know how, uh, how, do, how does our, excuse me, we also want to know if this optimal strategy changes with different levels of trait heritability. So heritability is an unknown value for most traits in most populations of species. It's really hard to measure in the field. Um, it's subject to um, selection strength in different locations. So it's really, it's really hard value to measure. It's an unknown for most populations. And we want to know if a better understanding of the true parameter value would change our management recommendations. So would spending time and effort to get a better understanding of the level of genetic variance present in the population, the or, uh, evolution capacity, will that change our management recommendation? So in this figure, you'll see a series of boxes. We have the genetic variance, so this adaptive capacity on the x-axis with zero being no, <clears throat> excuse me, no adaptive capacity, no evolutionary capacity. 0.1 being a low, low level of evolutionary capacity and 0.4 being a high level. Each strategy on the left here will get one box for each of those levels of evolutionary capacity. The boxes will be colored based on the relative performance of that strategy to the other strategies where the uh, where poorly performing strategies will be in red and uh, good performing strategies will be in blue. <clears throat> and if we look at Scenarios without any genetic variation, we can see that uh, the refugia strategy has this greatest blue value, so it's the best performing strategy when there's no uh, evolutionary capacity present in the populations. However, remember back, when there's no evolutionary capacity, all of the populations are functionally extinct. So it's the best performing strategy of a suite of very poorly performing strategies here. However, as soon as we explore scenarios with uh, evolution capacity present, we see this kind of switch where those strategies that performed well without evolution perform poorly when there is evolution. So all the temperature-based strategies perform poorly when <laughs> evolution capacity is present in the population. The diversity-based strategies perform quite well when there's evolution capacity present. In the population and the cover based strategies are kind of a mixed bag uh, where sometimes perform very well. So, this conservation reliant strategy per performs well when there's high evolutionary capacity. Um, but importantly, particularly for these top two strategies, the maximizing diversity and connectivity and the opportunistic strategy, they perform very well regardless of the level of genetic variance once you assume it is not zero. So, once we assume that there is evolutionary capacity in the population, these, these strategies are robust to that parameter uncertainty beyond that. 
So considering this evolution complete changes which strategies are optimal. And again, once we account for evolution, the diversity-based strategies are robust due to further uncertainty in that parameter. And since we know that there must be some genetic variance present on the landscape, uh, because this is what drives local adaptation, uh, this provides some promising results for our coral reef management. Importantly from this, even without perfect knowledge of the biological parameters, managers can recommend protecting a diversity of habitats and traits. And this is very good news because rapid action is necessary given the increased rate of deterioration of many global reefs, <coughs> excuse me, many coral reefs globally and the threat presented by further warming in the future. So we don't need to really wait to get a better handle on the exact value of that uh, evolutionary capacity on a given reef. Interestingly, our simulation is really the best case scenario for the temperature-based strategies, and they still perform very poorly once you account for evolution. So in our scenarios, in our simulated world, temperature is the only abiotic factor affecting coral growth and mortality. When in reality, there's going to be multiple stressors impacting species performance. And this could be uh, temperature, it could be uh, catastrophic storms, could be uh, ocean acidification or pH. Um, and this highlights the risk of focusing solely on a single environmental constraint or, or trait, even when, even in a scenario where that single environmental constraint is what's driving uh, population changes, these strategies focusing on that environmental constraint don't perform well. So by selecting for one trait, the managers in reality would be ignoring traits that respond to other limiting factors. Um, however, those diversity-based strategies would likely protect a greater diversity of genes across traits and across space, uh, maximizing the likelihood that somewhere in your network, there's gonna be the combination of traits and environment that will allow successful adaptation. So I'll hand it back over to Madhavi. Uh, thanks, Tim. And I'll just um, wrap us up really quickly here so that we have some time for questions. And I'm going to talk a little bit about um, how we're putting this science into practice. But first, I'm going to really um, simplify it and summarize down the results that Tim shared with us. The first result from this paper is that evolution can help rescue reefs from the effects of climate change. And that's a very different result to all of those headlines that I flashed up at the beginning of this talk. We're showing that once you take evolutionary responses into, into account, there is actually hope for coral reefs. The second is that management that reduces local stresses is essential. If you'll recall that figure that Tim showed, which is the tracks through time and the inside and outside of protected areas, it's the corals inside those managed areas that manage to survive. And then through time, those corals actually repopulate the rest of the reef. And the third point is that the choice of what to manage, the conservation strategy or how we allocate our management effort, that makes a huge difference. And this is where we really show that protecting diversity and maximizing connectivity is essential if we want reefs to thrive. And so at the Coral Reef Alliance, what we're doing is starting to turn this scientific, these scientific results into action. And we're just beginning this and we see this really as a collaborative process. And so we're definitely seeking partners both to help us turn science into action as well as to implement some of these ideas. So what we're starting to define here, if you can hit next, please, is um, what we call an adaptive reefscape, or it's, it's a network of healthy reefs where the emergent property is adaptation to rapid environmental change. And our initial results suggest that adaptive reefscapes are comprised of healthy reefs. That's where those local stresses are reduced. They contain a diversity of reef types. That's environmental conditions, habitats, genotypes, and phenotypes. Next, please. There's connectivity between those healthy reef populations. And next, and finally, they, we think they're pretty large. And so this map here is of the Mesoamerican reef. And I'm gonna use that as my example to show how at the Coral Reef Alliance, we're starting to put these ideas into practice. So the Mesoamerican reef, or MAR for short, um, stretches from Mexico through Belize, Guatemala, and into Honduras. And if you'll hit next, please. 
you'll see that historically, most of the action in this region has been focused on reducing local stresses in Belize and Mexico. Next, please which sets up a great network of healthy reefs across this, this region. However, next please, the, um, some models of larval dispersal for corals show that larvae actually travel from south to north in this region. And so what this network is missing is an essential source population. Next please. So what we've been doing is working in Honduras to help fill this gap. And Honduras has some remarkable reefs where live coral cover is up around 68%, which is very different to the Caribbean wide average of 18%. Next please. And so we're being, we've been building a network of effectively managed marine protected areas in Honduras. Next please. Thereby creating the connectivity across this whole region that will facilitate adaptation. So essentially, essential to all of this is reducing local stresses. And at the Coral Reef Alliance, we do that by working with local partners to reduce local stresses. We're doing that by ensuring that marine protected areas exist and are effectively managed. And we're also addressing wastewater pollution. And we're thrilled to report that last week, um, sorry, last month, uh, the um, uh, public swimming beach in Roatan on Honduras received the blue flag for safe swimming, which is an international recognition um, of the work we've been doing. Next, please. So I'm gonna end us where I began, which is by thinking about this ball that we are sitting on floating in space and thinking about all of the ecosystems uh, on our planet and how we rely on them. And thinking, I would encourage you to think about how these results that we've shared can apply to multiple ecosystems and how collectively we can set up these systems to be able to adapt to climate change. Next, please. Um, and just in final couple of words, I want to acknowledge our funders, Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, as well as the Nature Conservancy's Caribbean program. And there are contact details as well as our co-authors. Thank you very much. I'll pass it over to Sarah to, uh, for Q&A. Okay, thank you. Um, and just remind everyone, if you have questions, you can send them in through the chat or the, Q, the question and answer box. Um, Okay, and we do have one now. Let's see. Uh, it says, hi, I'm from El Salvador, which only has an East Pacific Ocean coast with rock reefs with coral formations. Diversity and abundance is lower than Caribbean and other coral reefs. However, there are unique coral species and are essential, that are essential for the rest of the coastal biodiversity. Is there management hope for site-specific conditions or East Pacific coral species doomed? Um, thank you for your question. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I can take a stab at this and then Tim, you you're, could feel free to chime in. Mm -hmm. I think that if, when I think about these results and I think about what we can do, um, I would say that, you know, focusing exclusively on, on corals just in El Salvador um, may not contain enough diversity um, to ensure adaptation to climate change. But if you could think about creating a network that includes corals in El Salvador and other places along that um, East Pacific Ocean coastline, um, you could probably set up a system there where uh, both the rocky reef associated as well as the coral reef associated species could thrive through time. So I don't see a reason why um, these results couldn't apply to this particular situation in El Salvador. And I don't see why there couldn't be hope for those reefs. Anything you want to add to? <coughs> Yeah, I, I agree with what you said. And then also the uh, kind of habitat conditions among those different reefs, uh, there's, there's likely some differences in temperature on the different reefs along the, the coast there. So there's gonna be some spatial diversity um, that could be worth protecting. And these patterns can also play out at smaller scales where protecting a diversity uh, <clears throat> diversity at, at small scales, diversity of coral types, diversity of temperatures at much smaller scales would also be beneficial to uh, promoting resilience. Okay. Um, did you guys have anything to add? Okay, great. Okay, sorry. I, I have the question. All right. Thank you very much. And uh, Luis, who, who posed the question, also said thank you. Um, there was a question as to whether the Coral Reef Alliance is working in Hawaii on the Marine 30 by 30 initiative. 
Yeah, I can, I can answer that one. And hi, Emily, <laughs> nice to see your name there. Um, yes, we are working uh, to get these ideas incorporated into Hawaii's Marine 30 by 30 planning, which is trying to establish 30% of the um, reefs in Hawaii in protected, effectively managed protected areas by 2030. And so, yes, we're actively working um, in particular with the federal government to share these ideas and get them out there and applied um, both at that scale as well as through our local work in the main Hawaiian islands. Um, this is a bit, okay, well, actually, there's another question. I'll get to my stretch question later. Um, it is the question whether you're taking into account other traits other than temperature. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Tim. I, I can take a, take a shot at that one. Um, so in, in this model, we only looked at temperature. Uh, however, we're pretty confident that our results will be robust to adding additional stressors in. Uh, remember, I was talking a bit about how this model is really the best case scenario for those temperature-based strategies or strategies focusing on a single um, trait because that Temp temperature is the only thing driving coral dynamics in our model system. So if you start adding in more stressors, more limiting factors, those strategies that are protecting a diversity of reefs are even more likely to be um, beneficial because they're more likely to protect a diversity across multiple traits. Okay. All right. Thank you, Cam. Um, another question, do you think marginal corals or those that can be found in extreme environments could be used as resources for restoration? Um, I can take a stab at this one. Uh, that's a great question, Eric, and thank you for, for that. And um, one of the, one of the approaches out there to coral conservation is what you're speaking about, which is restoration. And Yes, I mean, certainly we could use marginal corals um, or corals that survive extreme environments as resources for restoration. However, what this model shows is that as soon as we start narrowing down the um, available options that are out there for coral reefs, um, adaptation actually starts to decline. And so I would suggest instead of, of that approach that starts to narrow down and pre-select what we think the winners of the future will be, that instead, restoration that um, really uh, captures a wide, wide, wide array or diverse um, kinds of corals would probably set these systems up better to be able to adapt to climate change. Okay, thank you. I'd like to add on, on top of that, um, that want to want to be clear that we're not, that this research isn't saying that thermal refugia or hot reefs are not part of the answer. They are a component of these diverse strategies. There's, the strategy does not focus solely on one or the other. They, they, um, the diversity-based strategies kind of will just spread out effort amongst these different strategies. Okay. Sense. Okay, all right, thank you, Tim. Yeah. Um, another question came in. I was wondering about the strength of using ocean currents as a proxy for coral dispersal to map con connectivity and make spatial management decisions. Yeah, that's a, that's a really good um, uh, question. Um, and I think that the, one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is how much everything's going to change. And there are some data out there that show that um, ocean dis um, dispersal patterns, ocean connectivity are, is going to change as a result of warming oceans. So how much do we rely on what we know today versus what we think might be coming in the future? And what this, this research tells me is that um, what we need to do is really maximize diversity and connectivity. If we're doing that using contemporary ocean distribution patterns or connectivity patterns, that's probably pretty good. Um, let's not just rely on um, or count on these being the same in the future, if that makes sense. So let's try and maximize connectivities in all sorts of different directions. So if something changes in the future, we're still setting the system up to be robust to those changes. All right. Thank you, Madhavi. And we are out of time now. Um, but I, we so appreciate uh, both of you being here to present on this. Um, it's, it's great research uh, and 
hopefully uh, can see its way into practice and, and future policy and, and site selections. Um, but thank you so much, Madhavi and Tim. We really appreciate it. And thank you, everyone, who was able to participate today. Uh, we're glad you can make it. Um, the the um, a recording of the presentation will be posted on openchannels.org uh, within the next 24 to 48 hours if you're interested in, in checking it out or sending it to anyone else. All right. Well, thank you again. And thank you, Sarah and Ray, for hosting us. Yeah, thank okay. you. You're welcome. And, uh, and everybody, I hope you have a great rest of your day wherever you are. Okay. Bye.